Welcome, Dr. Zogby. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Around the world, an astounding 1 billion people, including 300 million children, are suffering from the ravages of devastating brain diseases. In 2010, you founded the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute, which you continue to lead. Can you start us off by describing its mission and focus? The mission of the Institute is to identify as many causes of neurological diseases as possible, understand the mechanism of the disease, and come up with meaningful treatment. That's really what we set out to do and continue to do. So much of what you're trying to accomplish at the Institute has been informed by your personal experience as a physician scientist, researcher, collaborator, and leader. So I'd like to take you through some of the turning points of your journey now. First, a little background for our audience. In the mid seventies, you came to the US to complete medical school when the civil war in your native Lebanon made it too dangerous to stay. Though other schools rejected you as an international transfer student, Nashville's Meharry Medical College did not. After a challenging transition year, you excelled at Meharry only to hit another roadblock. For whatever reason, various residency programs declined to interview you. But Dr. Ralph Feigen, then Physician-in-Chief of Texas Children, saw your application and invited you in. What happened? Magic happened, I must admit. Um, you know, after feeling um, such a challenge to really transition, leaving home during the war and coming to a new country and starting in a new place, um, I was so grateful that the dean uh, at Meharry Medical College gave me a chance and I got a great education there. And I was so happy when Ralph told me that I'm welcome at Baylor College of Medicine. And I loved my pediatric training here. I thought I'll be a pediatric cardiologist, but when I rotated on neurology, I met Marvin Fishman and I really became fascinated by child neurology and got my training in child neurology. And the intention was to be a clinician, but patient encounters changed my course. And that's why I pursued science. Yeah, and, and the, the, the story of your life has been unexpected twists and turns. And you had completed your, I guess, your pediatric residency and your pediatric neurology residency at Baylor College of Medicine. And as you said, by 1985, you're on track to be a clinical pediatric neurologist. But then you met a five-year-old girl named Ashley who changed the trajectory of your career. Can you talk about Ashley and the path she set you on? Sure. So I met Ashley actually in my first year of child neurology training, and I was heartbroken about her illness and the course of her disease. Ashley started life like every girl developing normally, did all the things that two-year-olds will do, including sometimes mouthing nursery rhymes and using her hands effectively. But all of that changed after her second birthday and everything she had learned, she lost. And language stopped, social interaction stopped. And instead of using her hands, she started wringing her hands, her balance deteriorated. And within the span of a few years, Practically every function in the brain wasn't quite normal, wasn't quite typical. And I thought that's really devastating and I was intrigued by that. And then a chance encounter a week later with another girl with Rett syndrome made me really uh, pursue this disease. At the time, the disease was only described in European cases in one report by Hagberg and colleagues. So having seen two, in one week, I was convinced there is more. And the clinic volunteers, the Bluebird uh, Circle clinic volunteers helped me pull chart and I reviewed them and found a few more cases. And that really set the course of my career. As I studied these cases and published my first paper with my colleagues and mentors here, I decided as soon as I finish child neurology, I will go to the lab, learn molecular techniques so that I can find the Red syndrome gene. Is it fair to say that Red syndrome then was understood as a constellation of neurological symptoms, but the cause of it was very much unknown? That's correct. It was, it was a syndrome that was described in Europe, uh, as I mentioned, in about 35 girls, and before that by Andreas Rett in 1966 in the German language. So it was very 
poorly understood. Not many people were aware of it clinically. And when the Hagberg report came out and I, we learned about Red Syndrome and started seeing patients with Red Syndrome, we realized that this exists much more frequently than we thought, but nobody knows the cause. And to me, it was intriguing because the girls are born healthy and then they regress and they lose milestones, but it's not degenerative. And the fact it's not degenerative and not also early developmental, where early on they're doing well, was really intriguing, as well as heart wrenching, as you can imagine. And nothing was known about it, but it was always females. And that to me was a clue that it must be a genetic disorder. Why would it spare the males? So you wanted to you wanted to you wanted to go into research to find the solution. And of course, wanting to pursue research it and accomplishing it are two different things. You approached Dr. Arthur Baudet, Baudet a preeminent geneticist at Baylor, to pursue, as you said, postdoctoral research in molecular genetics. The only problem was is that you didn't have a research background. How did that conversation with him go? Um, so I have to admit, Dr. Baudet was welcoming in a sense. He knew me from the clinics. He had encountered me in the clinic and he knew that I'm a good clinician. So when I visited with him and shared with him my interest in finding the Red Syndrome gene and my interest in learning molecular biology from him, we had a very nice conversation. He did give me a quiz in genetics to really make sure I have good fundamental uh, knowledge and that I passed. And then we talk about the process of becoming uh, adept in molecular biology and uh, molecular cloning and so on. And we discussed Rett syndrome. I told him about my passion about this disease. And I told him I have samples from about 200 different girls. And he was showing me the families. And I showed him that this is a sporadic disease. That means it's only one in a family. And this was 1985 when we didn't really have uh, the genome map. PCR wasn't even discovered. Polymerase chain reaction amplification was not even discovered. And, the, you know, there was no way we knew very little about uh, technologies that will speed up uh, genome cloning. So when I shared with him that this is a sporadic disease, he said, I don't think you can work on that. I'm really sorry. This is like a needle in a haystack. Find another problem. And we went back and forth and he was working on urea cycle defect. He was a giant in that field. But I told him I'm really not interested in that. <laughs> interested in different problems. And he was such an awesome mentor who really let me bring neurologic disease research into his lab outside of metabolic disorders. And he, we identified a family with a dominantly inherited balance disorder. And I told him, this is what I wanna work on. And that's what my, I wrote my K grant on. And he was really supportive. And in hindsight, I'm very grateful for his support because by working on a C1, I was able to be productive, uh, whereas the RET research took much, much longer for us to make the discovery. So can you talk a little bit about spinocerebellar ataxia type 1? So uh, spinocerebellar ataxia type 1, or we call it SCA1 for short, is a dominantly inherited balance disorder where the individuals will be healthy till they're about 40. And then that, that's when they manifest balance disorder and gradually their balance deteriorates, they'll become wheelchair bound. Eventually their breathing and swallowing become uncoordinated and they will choke and sadly die prematurely. And there was a family here in Montgomery, Texas. It's about 50 miles north of town. So I would travel there and examine members of this family and collect uh, blood for DNA samples to map the gene. It's inherited in a dominant manner, which means if a parent is affected, each child has a 50-50 chance of being affected. So I had over 100 affected individuals and constructed a 200-member pedigree. So this is a really Mendelian disease where you could map the gene. And right about the same time I was working on this, Huntington gene was mapped. So we thought this is doable. If Huntington could map their gene, we can map this gene. And with the mapping of the gene, then we pursued to get closer and closer to the gene event to eventually clone it. Um, 
So it was still an incredibly challenging problem, but not as challenging as Rett Correct. syndrome. Correct. So, so you began to work on these very important rare diseases. And yet within three years, you ended up applying for funding to start your own lab. What, what gave you the, the impetus to do that? So I maximized uh, my training in arts lab. I uh, obviously worked at the bench. It was a great environment uh, to learn all various molecular techniques so that you can become adept at mapping and cloning and screening for new markers and so on and so forth. And uh, having the K funding, of course, helped me really focus 100% on the research. My time was protected, so I didn't have to do any clinical medicine for those three years. But I felt I needed background in basic science. So I, I created my own program because I didn't want to be just a geneticist. I also wanted to be a neurobiologist and understand principles of cell biology. So I took quite a few graduate courses in those three years. And as I moved on in the lab and worked as hard as I could, Art felt by the end of three years that I'm actually ready to move on to my own lab. I wasn't sure I am ready, but he was <laughs> sure and put that confidence in, in me and wrote my first uh, R01 and got it. And that's when I moved uh, to my own lab. And it was an exciting time. It was a very small lab, just me and a graduate student and a technician. We were just three people moving into that lab and we grew very gradually and slowly. I have to think that having your little lab and your little team um, together, that it made you very close and probably has informed what you think collaborative relationships would be. What was it like with, with just, it was the three of you? We started just the three of us, and I had a lab. I was very eager to be in a strategic basic science building where I can interact with all the new faculty. At the time, Dr. Tom Kasky, the founding chair of our department, was building, it was an institute, now it's a department. He was really keen on hiring people with diverse expertise, mice, yeast, genetics of flies, and variety human and mixing us all together in that building. And I really wanted to be in that building, but there was, space was tight and I accepted to take two benches in a lab of another recruited colleague and said, I don't need the office. I'm happy just to have the benches and I'll sit at a desk. And I think was that was probably the greatest thing because being within the lab, always working with my student and my uh, technician who's still with me today, uh, Alana has been with me all these years, uh, was extremely helpful and productive. I did not go sit in an office. I actually interacted and then recruited a second graduate student and a second technician. And by me working side by side with them, I was the motivator. I was the one with the best hands at the bench. I truly believe those first few years were very critical in my success as a young investigator. And I think uh, you did something else that was really, really smart and necessary. I mean, it seems to me that you always were reaching for additional knowledge and you reach out to people even when you don't know them. And you make cold calls to colleagues around around the country. And I think you made a very important one um, when you reached out to Dr. Harry Orr at the University of Minnesota. Can you talk to me about why you called him sure. and how, what that has led to? So Harry was this brilliant investigator at the University of Minnesota. He was, I think, associate professor at the time. And I learned and I read papers that he is also trying to map and clone the SCA1 gene. And I thought about it. We're both working on the same disease and it, we're both generating critical tools. I was generating tools to help you create new markers for the chromosome so that you can walk closer and closer to the gene. And he had really large families. And I thought if we pool our resources together, perhaps we will get to the gene faster. So I called him about the possibility of collaborating. And I think he was a little bit taken back. He was silent for a moment or two. <laughs> and, and then he said, let's do it. He calls this the call. 
Um, and I think we'll, we'll both forever remember that because it was 1988 when we started our collaboration. And to this day, it's, it's the one thing that we cherish the most because we both learned so much from each other, from our trainee, we pulled resources, we, we went into multiple directions, complementing each other. It was really the greatest joy of uh, both of our careers. We both consider that the greatest joy. So you ended up with a uh, 30-year friendship and collaboration, and you it has also paid off. Can you talk about what, what you have discovered? So on April 8th, 1993, we got to the point right before, let me back up, before April 8th, we got to the point where we now narrowed the region to about a million base pairs. And we know that the gene is in that million base pair. But back then, in, nine, in the early 90s, a million base pairs, a lot of DNA to sift through to find the right gene. And Tom Caskey gave a presentation about myotonic dystrophy. Fragile X was discovered a couple of years before that. And then Tom gave a talk about myotonic dystrophy being a trinucleotide repeat, these three bases of DNA that repeat themselves. And they pass from generation to generation and the disease gets worse. And that's exactly what I had seen in my patients. You know, I examined all these SCO1 patients and I saw the disease gets worse. So I called Harry and I said, you know, it could be these trinucleotide repeats. What about we focus just on those and look for, for them in that million based region? Maybe we'll find one that's expanded. And we decided to split the region in two, but we kept about 70,000 base pairs of overlap. And on April 8, 1993, we sent each other faxes. We both discovered the mutation on the same day. And it was in that region of overlap. So it's stunning. And, and it's opened a pathway for treatment. That's correct. We then spent a lot of time creating different uh, tools to study the disease, to understand the effect of the mutation on the brain, to understand if it's reversible, to understand mechanisms and ways to sort of lower the toxicity of the mutant protein. And that's leading to now new pathways that could be applied eventually for therapies. So that's correct. And we really, we did it together. We kept going back and forth, advancing, building on each other's discoveries and coordinating the research between us. And it was really that first collaboration that gave me such a great taste about collaborations. So after finding the gene, remember I, in arts lab, I learned human genetics, I learned cloning, but I've never touched a mouse. I've never done biochemistry. So shortly after you find a gene, you want to understand the gene product, the protein. You want to work now with animal models. And the wonderful collaborative environment around me allowed me to reach to the best expert in mouse genetics, the best expert in biochemistry. And I started reaching and collaborating. And that's how we kept on advancing. This is why I learned to really value collaborations, because you know, the disease doesn't understand the boundaries of our training. The disease affects every aspect, you know, in the tissue. It's affecting the biochemistry, the physiology, the RNA, the proteins, and the, of course, the behavior. So having those multiple expertise and learning from others and working with others have been extremely valuable. And that was the inspiration to start the Duncan NRI, it is to bring people with diverse expertise and put them together so they can collaborate to solve tough diseases. What an amazing way to characterize it, that the, the disease doesn't know boundaries. And so you can't limit the, the, the boundaries for what expertise you think you may need to bring in to attack it. So um, all this time that you were working on these other major research initiatives, um, you did, never lost sight of Rett syndrome. And it has turned into a decades long research commitment for you. Um, can you describe how you got back to it and where you are now and, and, and how you ended up finding, discovering the gene that had the mutation that caused it? So um, really I never stopped a single day or month working on RET. Also, although while in arts lab, I was working on SCA1 on the side with my own hands, and then Alana was helping me and the, the second 
person we hired uh, help, we were always trying to find ways uh, to get closer to the Rett syndrome gene. We started by narrowing the genome from the whole genome to the X chromosome, realizing that this affects girls. And the only way I could think of it affecting girls is being on the X because females have two Xs. So the idea would be if the mutation on the X and the girl has mosaic, half of her cells affected, she will have breath, but the boy will be very severe. So that was the way we've worked on it. And basically we really tried to walk the X chromosome and test different genes to find the candidate genes. So it was truly a brute force effort after narrowing it down from a handful of families um, that we identified and collaborated also. Some families came from Uta Frankas and Carolyn Chen, and we narrowed the region to 30 megabases and simply started sequencing gene by gene. And back in those days, just for the younger generation, when you sequence a gene, you had to first identify all its components, which part make uh, the protein, the exons that make the protein, which parts don't. And you do all the sequencing on the bench. There wasn't any of that, just send it off for sequencing. So any genes that we wanted to exclude took about six to 12 months, depending on the size of the gene, at least six months. So we're going literally gene by gene, and uh, we had many red herrings. I will tell you, there was one time we found a gene on the X. We were very excited. This is it. The girl had a mutation that inactivated the gene, but then we found the same inactivating mutation in her healthy father. So we knew that it couldn't be. Sometimes we would find a patient with a with a break on the X chromosome translocation or an inversion. We spend a year or two or three cloning those breakpoints, and then we don't find the gene there. So it, we had a lot of you know twists and turns, but finally um, in nineteen. It, it got to the point nobody really in my lab wanted to work on Red Syndrome anymore. So everybody <laughs> abandoned that project. I had many more excitement over the Ataxia project. We discovered a gene that's really critical for development of inner ear hair cells and the cerebellum and, you know, the balance, sensory balance, proprioception. So everybody was working on that gene, atonal and a C1. Nobody wanted to work on Red. But Ruthie Amir was a wonderful uh postdoc who's joined the lab and for three years really nonstop she worked gene by gene until in August 1999 she discovered uh, mutations in a handful of patients and then we confirmed that and that's how the gene discovery came about. Which is MECP2? Correct. It's a gene that encodes a protein called methylcytosine binding protein 2. I call it MECP2 for short. Uh, when cytosines are methylated, it can bind and it affects gene expression. That protein was identified almost uh, nine years before by Adrian Bird as a protein that binds methylated uh, cytosines. But nobody knew anything about its role in brain function. Nobody had any connection to red. So when we found it as the gene that's mutated in red, now we, you know, started to try to understand the mechanism of disease. And and in fact, there's I, I think you're working on two tracks right now. You you've discovered that there is the potential for intensive behavioral therapy, perhaps to be effective before symptoms show up with with some children and then then you have you're looking at sort of other treatment avenues um can you talk about those sure um so one one important thing we learned from the various genetic studies and creating different animal models one thing we actually learned is that one the dosage of this protein matters if you have too little you have red syndrome and if you have too much you have another disorder we call it and then Linda Van Esch in Belgium found humans with duplications of the gene. So we first discovered it in the mouse that too much of the protein can cause disease. And then we found it. she found first set of humans that we saw many here with duplications spanning the MACP2 gene. So we call it the Goldilocks protein. You have to get it just right. And we've worked on that area to try to reverse the disorder and come up with a therapy. I'll get back to that later. But for RET, we were really trying to understand why does 
loss of this protein in half of the cells cause so much uh, havoc and so many neurologic problems. And it turns out this protein is really important for the function of the neurons. And when, when it's missing or mutated, you partially disable the neuron where it's functioning at about 70% of its capacity, not 100% capacity. So as we began to contemplate, and it's important for all brain cells. So as we become to contemplate therapies here in the Institute, we have phenomenal neurophysiologists. So I collaborated with a colleague, John Rock Tang, using deep brain stimulation, which as you know, is used in the clinic to treat Parkinson's disease, some tremors. And we found that if you stimulate the circuit, now you normalize the activity of neurons and you change all the symptoms, at least in the part of the brain we stimulated, the hippocampus, so the animals can learn and can remember. But the breath affects the whole brain, and we're thinking it's really going to be hard to bring back the normal capacity of function to these neurons if we're going to have to do multiple regions of deep brain stimulation. So we're pondering what can mimic brain stimulation, but it's less invasive. And that's where the intensive training came about. The idea is, as you know, the more you practice something, the more you can get better at it. And we thought maybe the red neurons are can get better if we do intensive training. But we knew parents do a lot of physical therapy when they have a child diagnosed with red syndrome. So we wonder if maybe the timing of that intensive training is important. And if we started before symptoms, it would help. And that's what we did in the animal models. And Nate Akili, the student who did this, found that indeed, if we start early and train them either on a motor task or a learning task, we can get them to behave almost as good as normal. And we will keep it up and delay the onset of the disease in mice by months. So that's really exciting. And if we can sort of identify girls early on, say at birth through newborn screening, we have typically a couple of years, two to three years. Most girls are diagnosed by three years. You have a two to three year window to train them. And even if it's just delaying the course of the disease by one year, let's say, that's great until we have more definitive treatments and they can respond better to any new interventions that we will come up with. And you just very briefly, you alluded to um, a a related disease that is affected by the same gene um, and the, the, the VECP2 duplication syndrome, Correct. and which is kind of not the opposite, but it's too much, right? right. So, and, and, and you've been had, and, and there are two points I want to ask you about is one is I think that what is so interesting about the research is when you identify a certain gene is causing a problem, you find actually a constellation of other diseases that may be impacted. And so, yes, you start on, on, on rent, but now you have treatment avenues for another syndrome because you discovered this gene and you discovered how it impacts different parts of the, the brain. That is very, very true what you just said. I actually learned so much from studying rent syndrome. And to your point, let's focus first on the duplication. We've you know, studied that, we had the mouse model that reproduces all features of the disease. So we tried a treatment where we use a small piece of DNA called an antisense oligo that you, you can basically deliver in the ventricle. You can do it eventually, as you know, in spinal muscular atrophy, these are, were delivered in, via a spinal tap to human patients. You put it in the spinal fluid and it'll uh, hybridize to the RNA of the MACP2 gene. And if you have too much RNA and you've got this small oligo now, this hybrid will be cleaved by enzymes and degraded. So you can decrease the mutant protein back to normal levels. And you can titrate this just like you would titrate blood pressure medication or blood sugar medication, because you don't want it to go too low. So when we showed in mice that you can actually treat these mice when they're symptomatic adult mice, we even waited till they're nine months old where they're having seizures all day long. And when we normalize their MACP2 level, we found you can actually reverse the symptoms and they get much better. So that is really pretty exciting. And that gave the proof of concept data 
to move uh, in the to clinical studies and natural history study that is now ongoing in preparation to start such clinical trials building of these studies. So that's really exciting that the, this kind of work, this in-depth work that led you to discover too much of the protein is bad, you have the animal model, you can reverse it, and now there's at least a strategy for these children who are devastated by having too much of this protein. That's I'd like to... Sorry, I just want to add, that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, you know, when red syndrome happen, you typically have a mutation that inactivate the protein pretty badly. But we also learned that milder and milder mutation typically cause more psychiatric disorder or just mm -hmm. autism or autism with uh, behavioral problems. So it's sort of, you start learning from one disease and one gene about the spectrum from the very mild that may manifest later on in life as a psychiatric disease, all the way to the most severe that manifests in the neonatal period with very severe disease. Well, this is great. I, I actually, what you just said, I wanna actually bring us full circle now back to the um, Duncan Neurological Research Institute and your vision for it, because as we've talked about, um, translational research seems to depend on both a investment in pure research where you're not sure where it's going to go, targeted research, and also an understanding that one discovery may lead to, uh, for one disease, devastating disease, may lead to solutions for many, but it requires very robust research capabilities. Can you talk about what you tried to bring together at the Duncan NRI, what kinds of expertise and resources to um, not only propel the research, but also um, tighten the relationship between um, bench to bedside or bedside to bench to bedside as you as your route. Thank you, actually. That's a very important question. So if you look at the Duncan NRI, you're going to find among our 33 or so investigators, about seven of them study fly genetics. They study the fruit flies. And those individuals have in the early years done pure fundamental research to try to understand development, to try to understand how the body is laid out, how limbs develop, how brain cells develop. But through that work, they understood the synapse better. Through that work, they developed new technologies to engineer and manipulate the flies in so many different ways to the point you can take out any gene, replace it, with a human equivalent of that gene and learn about the relationship between humans and fruit fly function. So fast forward to the past four years, that became really the cornerstone for discovering the most complicated unsolvable disorders. Basically, when you have one patient with a mutation in their DNA that has never been seen before in anyone, how do you know this poses the disease? Here comes the fruit fly to the rescue, <laughs> where you eliminate the, the fly gene and the fly will have damage, let's say, to the side. You put the human gene, you rescue, and you put the human gene with the variant. And if it rescues, you know that this variant is benign. If it doesn't rescue, you know this mutation is inactivating the gene. That's one example. And about 40 diseases that were unsolvable from around the country came to us and the team worked together to solve these diseases. So you got a fly geneticist working with a clinician, working with someone who may do human neurons and you know, working with the biochemist, all of them working together to actually solve a problem and understand it better. So, and then there's of course computational biologists that help with the analysis. So it's that kind of environment that we need today to really start moving forward with cha solving challenging disorders. And, you know, it, 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 she said that the human genome wasn't even mapped when you were starting work on, on RED. And now you can rely on, I, I think you've got AI and big data and engineering. And, um, and just briefly, can you talk about your core labs? So um, one thing, we mentioned the need to really approach a disease from so many angles, right? Behavior, physiology, biochemistry, computation. And I know I know myself, as you 
alluded at the beginning, I reach out to people. I'm not shy of calling someone cold, but most scientists would not do that. You know, it's a little bit intimidating for some scientists. It's a little bit unusual, but by being surrounded with resources and expertise that you can just walk down the hall and you find someone who can characterize your mouse and do behavioral studies on it, somebody who will do physiology and collaborate with you, it's much easier. So I, basically, we brought a world to allow intense collaboration all under one roof. And that's what makes a big difference. And important part of that is having computational scientists and engineers. Now we all talk about AI and the power of computation. But my first hire in the Institute was in 2010, computational scientists. And having computational scientists as a mathematician was very important from back then for us. And we grew together. So they speak our language and they understand it. And we go back and forth. Oh, that's wonderful. Dr. Hudasad, we thank you for sharing some of your remarkable story and the inspiring work that you and your colleagues are engaged in in unlocking treatments for these neurological diseases and bringing hope to millions of patients and the family members who love them. Thank, thank you, you so much. It's my honor. Thank you.